are going to hear from our first of the 2019 class Next Generation Leaders, uh, Aparna Burderi. Aparna is a postdoctoral scholar at the University of California in San Francisco in the lab of Arnold Kriegstein at the Eli and Edith Broad Center of Regeneration Medicine and Stem Cell Research. Her research is focused on using single cell RNA sequencing to characterize cell types and in the developing uh, cortex across areas in human and non-human primates as well as in glioblastoma. Aparna received her PhD in cancer biology at Stanford, where she focused on epithelial tissue differentiation and neoplasms. Today, she will give a talk uh, titled Understanding Cell Type Identity in the Developing Human Cortex and Glioblastoma. Please join me in welcoming Aparna. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, and thank you for having me here today. I'm excited to be part of this wonderful event, and it's already been amazing to see the excellent work that's happening here at the Allen. As everyone here is well aware, the adult human brain is a very complicated structure, organized into many parts with many cell types. And understanding the way that these structures are independently made, as well as how they work together, is really important to understanding human normal development, normal function, and disease. The outermost layer of the human brain, the cortex, is really important for many aspects of perception and judgment and is organized into different structures across the cortical span. It has been recently shown that these differences in structure also correspond to many differences in cell type composition and cell type identity. And understanding how each of these areas is made and generated is really important for understanding many aspects of normal human brain function, as well as diseases, ranging from neurodevelopmental disorders, psychiatric disorders, as well as ways of treating injury, neurodegenerative disease, and even understanding the origins of cancer. Cortical development is a process that is complicated and concerted, in which you have a originally presumptively uniform neuroepithelia that gives rise to the radioglia, which are the neural stem cells of the cortex. Through intermediate progenitor cells, uh, they give rise to the excitatory neurons, and later on in cortical development, they give rise to glia. There's already been extensive and very interesting discussion of what is a cell type, and I think many of those points about wanting to access function, but also taking other parameters of a cell to better understand what defines its type are really important. And in the developmental context, there's another access to this. How does the process of maturation of developmental time and lineage contribute to the process of differentiation and the emergence of a diversity of cell types? And how does that cell type taxonomy really lay over the developmental time periods. And this is something that we are really interested in accessing and understanding. And so I'd like to take you through the ways that we have been thinking about this from a couple different perspectives. I'll start by discussing how developmental trajectories in normal cortical development are interesting and create a basis for which we can then interrogate other aspects of our modeling or disease. I'll then go into a comparison between these normal cell types and cortical organoids, specifically interrogating how we can better model in vitro development, how we can better model in vitro development of the human brain. And finally, discuss how these same developmental trajectories can be co-opted in a cancer like glioblastoma, which shows us how these developmental trajectories may be important aspects of cellular biology and that can be reactivated during different time points during the lifespan, but often in a disease context. So to begin, I'd like to do a very brief overview of the developmental trajectories that occur in normal cortical development. As part of the Brain Initiative Cell Census Network, our lab, along with many others, have been engaged in sampling and creating atlases of the developing human brain. To do this, we have been looking not only at the cortex, shown here, but also other brain structures. And during developmental time points, specifically during first and second trimester, we have primarily been using single cell sequencing to identify the cell types. At later stages, we and others in the lab in particular have been focusing on third trimester and early postnatal periods and seeking to identify how we can eventually bridge these cell types with the adult cell types that you've already heard so much about today. From this work, we have generated two, um, data from about 2.5 million cells and looked at time periods as early as gestational week six and spanning into, into young adult stages. We have explored 15 brain structures, 
six cortical regions, and have sampled 22 individuals. And for the second trimester aspect of this data set, which really covers the stages of peak neurogenesis, I won't go into much detail, but I'll quickly show you a plot here, which recapitulates some of the initial findings that we and others at the Allen have made before, that there are important differences, particularly in the excitatory populations, where the cells are segregating by cortical area. And we're really interested in intersecting these data with other data sets across cortical areas and understanding the developmental trajectories that are important for the emergence of these specific cell types. At the earlier stages, I think there's some interesting questions, especially about the diversity of the populations that have not been molecularly characterized before because of difficulty of accessing these samples at a single cell level. We receive our samples from the Human De Biological Developmental Resource in the United Kingdom and microdissect these samples as much as we are able into broad areas. From this, we have then performed 10x genomic single cell RNA sequencing. If we look at just the cortex or the presumptive cortex from these samples, we see that there's a number of clusters colored by cluster here, and that this suggests there's impressive heterogeneity at the molecular level, even at these early stages. We also see that there is interesting segregation of the earliest time points, Carnegie stages up until um, Carnegie stage 15, in the middle of this plot, and on the edges you can see stronger enrichment for the older stages. If we look at the cell types that are comprising each of these uh, clusters, we can look at the broad characterization of these types. And we can see that there are indeed a large number of progenitors, as would be expected. And that many of these progenitors likely are neuroepithelial in origin because they do not yet have strong expression of um, radial glia markers. We see a very small number of intermediate progenitor cells, which is to be expected. This is at the tail end of the uh, first trimester when you would not expect significant amounts of neurogenesis. But we do see a small number of neurons, including those that are expressing BCL11B or CTIP2 and SATB2. Interestingly, um, in a aspect of this data that we have not completely characterized is about 50% of the progenitor cell types express this marker loom and also have markers that are suggestive of a mesenchymal identity. And we don't know what this population gives rise to or what its role is at these early developmental stages, but does show us that there's a lot of undescribed and interesting aspects of development that we can access from this first trimester data. We've been seeking to look at the trajectories that give rise to not only the uh, progenitor populations, but also the neuronal populations. And we can see that there are two primary trajectories that we can observe using RNA velocity, a technique for looking at the lineage relationships based on RNA splicing uh, trajectories within the data set. And we can see that there are progenitor trajectories as well as a strong neurogenesis trajectory, which tells us there may be streams that would be very interesting to pursue within in this data set to better understand the pathways and genes that are driving these, and that could help us better understand some of the heterogeneous populations that exist molecularly at these stages of development. While there's a lot to dive into in this data, I would like to transition at this point and think more about ways in which we can apply these data to other questions. And specifically, one of the questions that I've been really interested in is how to model cortical development with organoids. So as I mentioned, there are many important considerations when thinking about cell types, particularly during developmental stages. And as we have seen, there's important trajectories of cell type specification, and these are parallel and important to correspond to trajectories of maturation and also to aerial identity. And as you may know, cortical organoids are in vitro models that are generated for, from pluripotent stem cells that enable the generation of neural progenitor rosettes, which then are created into three-dimensional organoids. And these organoids are being used as models not only of development, but also of a variety of diseases. And we think that it's important to really benchmark these organoids to better understand how their cell types and trajectories mimic those in normal development in order to create the best model and the best conclusions from the data that we are observing. We performed single cell RNA sequencing as I described, and here I have used five individuals for, from the primary data across seven cortical areas, looking from gestational week six to 22. We obtained from these individuals, nearly 200,000 cells. And as you can see, we have the major cell populations that you would expect. 
progenitors marked by SOX2, and HOPX labeled outer radial glia, which are an important and interesting subtype of radial glia that the Kriegstein lab has long been interested in. We also find intermediate progenitor cells labeled by eomes, as well as a variety of neurons that are marked either by uh, neuro D6, and then we have upper layer neurons that are marked by SAT B2, as well as a population of inhibitory neurons. When we looked to generating data from organoids, we wanted to look across a variety of ways of making these cortical organoids. There are a number of protocols that go from a least to most directed levels of differentiation, and we wanted to employ organoid protocols that were using different levels of this directed differentiation to see if there's any difference in terms of the dorsal identity, as well as in terms of the fidelity to the primary data. So we used data from four stem cell lines, three of the protocols, as well as all published data sets on the remaining of those protocols, and generated 37 organoids, ranging from week three to 24 of culture, which ought to correspond to the stages of development that we previously explored. We generated over 200,000 cells and see similar populations. For example, we have the SOX2 labeled progenitors, but a smaller percentage of HOPX labeled outer radial glia cells. We have very few intermediate progenitor cells and a smaller number of neurons and particularly a much smaller number of SATB2 positive cells. We also interestingly do identify some DLX6AS1 positive inhibitory neurons, which suggests that a subset of our organoids were actually off target because they're not supposed to be making these inhibitory neurons. In order to start the comparisons, we looked to the correspondence between our organoid and primary clusters. And using correlative analysis, we wanted to explore the similarities between these populations. In the corner here, you can see that the most strongly corresponding group of cells relate to a dividing identity. And that makes sense that the division programs used by both primary cells and organoid cells are going to be similar. Interestingly, however, the next closest correspondence were these interneurons, which suggests that those off-target cells really do look like the interneurons that we're seeing in primary samples. However, we were most interested to explore how well are radial glia being recapitulated. And what we observed was that the subtypes of radial glia that are so clearly defined within the primary data set are not clearly distinguished within the organoid. And in fact, individual cells are expressing multiple identities of these subpopulations of radial glia, generating what we refer to as panradial glia. Interestingly, we see some similar expression mixing within the neurons and similarly identify panneuronal subtypes. We can quantify this by looking at the number of subtypes that we see within both primary data and organoids and see particularly for the radial glia and neurons that there's a significantly larger number of these subtypes within the primary data. When we do the quantification, we can see that the state and class as defined here by dividing or non-dividing or neuronal or non-neuronal are significantly more highly conserved than type or subtype. We wanted to explore why this was happening. And one of the metrics that we used was this idea of marker specificity. How clearly does a marker that is defining either class, state, type, or subtype within the primary data, how clearly does that does that look specific to each of those individual categories? And across the board, we find that there is significantly less specificity within the organoids, suggesting that there are not clear boundaries between cell types in the organoid as there are in the primary data. As an example of this, we took the genes that were discriminating between radial glia and neurons in primary cells and looked at their expression across radial glia and neurons. And as expected in orange, you see that there's a clear segregation between radial glia genes that are not expressed in neurons and vice versa. By contrast, you see that organoid cells are bridging this gap and having expression of radial glia and neuronal genes in both radial glia and neurons, validating our hypothesis that there's not clear segregation of these cell types. One of the things that we wanted to look at was how this is reflected in maturation. And while many people have described the structure of organoids before, here's a extreme contrast where you see that there's ex expansion of the lamina within the cortex during the time periods that we have sampled and that the progenitor layer 
be expands and creates these beautiful scaffolds that allow for neuronal migration into the cortical plate. In the organoid, at early stages, you do see beautiful rosette structure. But by the time you get to week 15, the structure is lo largely lost, suggesting that there are important differences in structure between primary and organoid samples. And we wanted to explore how this is reflected at the level of molecular maturation. Using a technique that we have used before, we used our data and took the radioglia to generate weighted gene co-expression networks that we were able to correlate to molecular identity in a subset of the, in a training set of the data. We then took these networks and applied them to organoid. And what we saw is that when we took the remaining radioglia, there was a strong correlation between the pseudo-age metric based on the networks and the actual age in primary samples. But there was no correlation in organoids until the switch to gliogenesis, suggesting that they are recapitulating this major transition from neurogenesis to gliogenesis, but are not recapitulating the important molecular maturation trajectories during those stages of neurogenesis. We also wanted to explore how this manifests in terms of aerial identity. And similarly, we used network analysis to identify the areas from our primary data and applied them to the organoid. Interestingly, we found that organoid cells do recapitulate aerial identity, but that they are not spatially segregated. So an individual organoid will have strong heterogeneity of aerial identity within a single organoid, and that cells that are next to one another from the same organoid may be related to different aerial identity. This is consistent with some of our work thinking about how aerial identity may be a core feature of differentiation, which does appear to be preserved within the organoid, but that they lack some of the signaling and organizational centers that then would dictate spatial organization of these areas within the organoid. Previous work that we had done and the work that we did in this paper showed us that there were a number of networks that are strongly enriched in the organoid and that are enriched in all organoid protocols that we observed. And these strongly correspond to glycolytic and endoplasmic reticulum stress. We took three genes and validated that they were widely expressed in organoids. PGK1 is a marker of glycolytic stress, and ARKIN1 and GORSB2 are markers of endoplasmic reticulum stress. And we see that they're broadly expressed within the organoid, but are almost not at all expressed in either primary fixed samples or those that are kept in culture for a week. We wanted to explore if this indicated that there was a significant difference in terms of the culture conditions that were driving the limitations and the upregulation of stress within organoids. To do this, we took primary tissue and sorted out progenitors and infected them with a GFP virus. We transplanted them into the organoid and then looked at these cells two weeks after transplantation. In the transplants, we were able to see integration of the progenitors, including hopax positive outer radial glia cells, into the rosettes of the organoid. And after two and a half weeks, saw an upregulation of PGK1 and GORSB2. Interestingly, when we looked at the subtype specification of these cells, we saw a significant decrease in the subtype specification of the transplanted cells, suggesting that the stress may be driving the limitations of subtype specification. We then wanted to do a reciprocal experiment. So we took a organoid, dissociated it, and transplanted it into the cortex of a P4 mouse. We then sorted out the human cells and explored their identity transcriptomically. In this stain here, you can see that the, there's a segregation of the human cells from the mouse cells. They don't appear to integrate, but they do appear to displace the mouse cells. When we looked at the morphologies of the cells post-transplantation, the first thing that was very striking was that there were much more complex morphologies in the transplanted cells compared to what we have ever seen in the organoid. And this was reflected both in terms of progenitors, in terms, especially the um, cells here, as well as in terms of both astrocytes and neurons. We also were able to see an innervation of uh, vasculature from the mouse into these transplants, suggesting that they were receiving nutrients. When we explored stress, we saw that there was zero expression of these stress genes, and that this was quantified both at the level of immunostaining and single cell RNA sequencing. <laughs> 
Once we looked at subtype specification, we did see an increase in subtype specification of outer radial glia cells and newborn neurons, suggesting that, in fact, the stress may be an important limitation towards the subtype specification within these transplants and within organoids in general. So when we are comparing the primary to the organoid, we see that there are important differences. However, there are also major similarities, and that these are things that can be overcome. So for future directions, I'm really interested in exploring how does metabolism influence cell identity and differentiation. And as a regulatory program, how is metabolism involved in many of these developmental processes? Additionally, can new systems, either culture or transplantation, be used to improve the fidelity of our cortical organoids in order to better recapitulate normal developmental processes that are really important for study of normal development and disease? So moving and pivoting quite significantly, I'd like to explore a different angle of how we have leveraged our primary data sets to better understand human disease, specifically glioblastoma. You may know that glioblastoma is an aggressive form of brain cancer and is, in fact, the most common form of adult brain cancer in the United States. It is currently untreatable, and most people will die from this cancer in about 18 months. People have long been interested in the molecular underpinnings of glioblastoma, and one of the first cancer genome atlas studies was on glioblastoma, defining subtypes within this cancer. With the advent of single cell sequencing, people found that these subtypes, the proneural, neural, classical, and mesenchymal, were actually co-expressed within a tumor. And in fact, each individual cell had an identity, but sometimes you could have a mix of these populations within that tumor. More recently, people have looked at how these particular populations may correspond to the state of the cancer, suggesting that there may be some interplay between the populations that, we ident that are identified within a, within a cancer. However, nobody has been able to take actual primary data and really benchmark the cell types that are existing within the cancer. And so this is what we sought to do. How could we leverage our developmental data, as well as existing adult data, both from our lab and others, to identify the cell populations that exist within the tumor bulk? And so we performed single cell RNA sequencing on 11 glioblastoma patient resected tumors. And from this, observed that there was significant segregation by tumor sample from each individual. This has previously been described as we know that there are a lot of private mutations that drive independent signaling differences within each tumor. However, we were heartened to see that there were similarities in terms of some of these cell types, and that we were able to identify populations like uh, OPCs, as well as progenitor populations, immune populations, and neuronal populations. We also saw some bizarre populations that you would never see, but we, using our correspondence metrics, were able to identify mixed progenitor neuron populations, where literally we are finding signatures that strongly correspond to neuron, but also have strong division signatures, which we think are very interesting and reflective of how dysregulated this disease is. One of the things that we were interested in was looking at the heterogeneity of the cancer stem cell population. And to do this, we took the putative markers of cancer stem cells that have previously been published in the literature and looked at their expression across the tumors and the cell types that we found. And what we found was very interesting, that the Cancer cell, the cancer stem cell markers that we were identifying seemed to have patterns where certain ones were traveling together, and these seemed to be defined by individual tumor populations. When we quantify this, we found that rather than having these markers travel by cell type, so having one particular type of cell be one particular stem cell, we instead found that when you look at these populations of cell types, that they were expressing the cancer stem cell markers widely, and that when you looked at the identity of glioblastoma cancer stem cells in a single tumor, you could find between two to seven different types of glioblastoma cancer stem cells, suggesting that a single tumor has multiple cancer stem cell populations, which may be accounting for some aspects of the aggressiveness of this disease. One of these populations was our 
uh, the outer radial glia, which we have extensively studied and know much about its molecular as well as behavioral properties. And we found that the radial glia that were corresponding within the um, glioblastoma cancer stem cells most strongly corresponded to outer radial glia and recapitulated networks with some of the main marker genes that we have previously identified in this population, including PTPRZ1, TNC, and LIFR. Outer radial glia undergo a characteristic so mitotic somal translocation or jump and divide behavior. And using primary tumor samples, we put them into culture and were able to observe this behavior. When we look at these cells more closely, we also find that they give rise to dividing daughter cells. So here you just saw the jump and divide, and after a few Seconds, we will see that the progeny of these outer radial glia like cells give rise to dividing, pro, pro, dividing progeny. This suggests that this population is important not only for generating other cells in the tumor, but also maybe generating transit amplifying cells similar to what we observe in normal development. We hypothesize that this may be an important population for subsets of the tumor. And so using those markers that we previously identified, including PTPRZ1, we isolated cells from primary tumors and transplanted them to organoids. You might be wondering why we didn't do these transplants into the mouse. And the answer is that glioblastoma cells are notoriously difficult to xenograft into mice. And in our hands and in the hands of our collaborators, one in 100 of the tumors will actually engraft in a mouse, suggesting that there's a strong selection for the cells that we are studying in mouse xenografts. And therefore, it is important to have other models as well. In this experiment and the variety of experiments that we did, 100% of the tumors were able to engraft into the organoid, suggesting that this could be an alternative model to study some of the lineage properties of glioblastoma stem cells. Like we did for our other organoid experiments, we labeled these cells and then transplanted them into the organoid such that we could retrieve them after several weeks. What we found was that the cells that we did isolate were enriched for radial glia, although there were a few other cell types that also express PTPRZ1, but that the negative sort was virtually depleted of outer radial glia. Interestingly, we found that the PTPRZ1 positive cells were able to give rise to a number of other cell types within the tumor that were not seen in this original population. However, this was also true of the negative population. And this suggested to us two things. One, that the PTPRZ1 positive cells are indeed a cancer stem cell population that are able to give rise to parts of the tumor bulk. But also, there is heterogeneity of the cancer stem cell population, suggesting that the PTPRZ1 negative population likely also contains a stem cell population, and that this explains some of the difficulty in treating these tumors. Because if we target one of these cell types, we may not be targeting the others. PTPRZ1 has previously been described to signal through the ROROC pathway, which interestingly has also been described to be required for mitotic somal translocation. And in other mouse models of glioblastoma or childhood cancers, it has been observed that PTPRZ1 is required for invasion. So we felt that perhaps PTPRZ1 through MST or the jump and divide behavior is in fact promoting tumor invasion. We knocked this down, we knocked down PTPRZ1, both in primary tissue and in glioblastoma PDX models, and found that indeed knockdown of this gene significantly decreased the length of MST, suggesting that this is an important mechanism that may be promoting the invasion that has previously been associated with PTPRZ1. We also wanted to look at this invasion, and in this case, we did use the mouse, but we used a patient-derived xenograft model, which is known to engraft in the mouse, but in which we were able to identify the outer radial glia-like cells, and did find that after transplant, and then serial transplant, we were able to identify cells that had migrated outside of the tumor into other distant sites in the brain, and in fact were expressing PTPRZ1, suggesting that this may be an important mediator of this invasive behavior and repopulation of the tumor, as happens in recurrence. Altogether, 
This shows us that our ability to use our cell type annotations from the development and the adult human give us opportunities to identify the heterogeneous tumor composition of glioblastoma and also to see that there's a large number of cell types that exist within each tumor that may be arising from a heterogeneity of glioblastoma stem cells. Moving forward, I'm interested in pursuing how PTPRZ1 mechanistically is enabling this invasion, as well as what the cell of origin is for glioblastoma that is giving rise to these stem populations that we typically don't see except in the developmental context. I'm also interested to understand the lineage relationship between the cancer cell types within the tumor. Is there a single cell of origin, or is there a tumor niche that somehow enables the generation of these diverse cell types that would not traditionally be lineage correlated in a pure developmental context? And tying together the various points throughout this talk, um, as we have discussed here, we know that cell type is a work in progress, but it does give us a frame to understand cortical development trajectories and then apply these to models in vitro as well as in disease. And that for this reason, it's been a really effective tool in analyzing and navigating some of the data sets that I've been working on. And with that, I'd like to thank my mentor, Arnold Kriegstein, who has given me a lot of independence in pursuing a diversity of projects, as well as my collaborators, um, Madeline, Lizzie, Tom, and Alex, as well as the others that are labeled here um, throughout the lab, and my funding sources. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. We have time for a few questions and a gentle reminder to wait and speak into the microphone. Great talk, Aparna, super. So what do you think causes, or can you hypothesize or postulate what causes the stress in organoids and what are the ways to make organoids better? It's a great question. And I think that there's definitely something about the in vitro conditions that are driving the stress because we see the stress in every protocol that has been published from everyone else's data from our own hands. So something about that culture condition, although I think that we need pretty careful manipulations of those culture conditions to really understand how external nutrient availability or other aspects of uh, nutrient delivery to these cells is related to the stress pathways. The other thing that I didn't mention in the talk, but that we have seen, is that some other cell types, including microglia or interneurons or other uh, endothelial cells that do exist in primary tissue, are not present in the cortical organoid. And when we have generated primary aggregates from early stage gestational week 14, 15 uh, samples, we do see that they upregulate the stress, but not as highly, and they increase their subtype specification compared to those without those other cell types. So in my mind, I think it's an interplay both of nutrient availability as well as the signaling between other cell types that seems to be required for the proper maturation of these cell types. Well, these differences between the uh, living organism and the organide uh, lead to any uh, insights into the original mitosis process where you go from one to two cells and build on up where the overall structure or architecture of the development situation specifies what should happen next. I think that the understanding the programs that are really related to both the structural organization as well as the subtype specification is something that would be really cool to try to understand in the organoid. And perhaps we can use some of these data sets that we have to understand processes of how the mitosis and how signaling is happening that could then be tested in the organoid. But as the technology stands today, I'm not sure that we can really um, identify too many insights into that, those processes currently. Over here in the front. Okay, am I on? Yeah. Okay, so I hear you talking about uh, nutrients and uh, also these uh, cancer um, um, uh, cells also. And I'm just curious, has there been any testing uh, involving frequencies? Um, I have actually studied about frequency and its effect on stress. And I'm just wondering if uh, different frequencies actually have the effect to have an impact by lowering the stress and uh, creating more of a, um, uh, just a more uh, peaceful atmosphere for these cells and if it has it had a, if it's been proven to have frequency having an effect on the cancerous uh, um, these 
I'm sorry, I'm not the best at describing that, but I'm just curious with frequency, using frequencies. Uh, we have not manipulated frequency in either the cortical organoid or the cancer context, but it's an interesting idea and something that would be cool to follow up on in the literature and then potentially implement. Has the uh, Allen Institute, have they uh, done any kind of research with involving frequency and in, in working with the brain much at all? Or? Uh, I can't speak to that. I'm not from the Allen Institute, so I, but I'm sure other people from the Institute would be happy to answer your question after. All right, thank you. All right, let's thank Aparna and the rest of our morning presenters again.